Why do I recommend an inexpensive slow cooker for plant-based cooking? Let's talk about it today on the Vegan Family Kitchen podcast. My name is Brigitte Jim and I am your host around here as well as, frankly, the do-it-all. Many people bought a slow cooker only to leave it to gather dust on top of their fridge. That's really too bad because using a slow cooker for plant-based cooking is a great way to decouple cooking from eating. Throw in the ingredients in the morning, switch it on to low for the day, and come back to a fragrant simmer dinner waiting for you in the kitchen eight hours later. It makes an even greater contribution if incorporated into your weekend batch cooking arsenal, as I will explain below. For good results, however, you do need to know what is the right thing to cook in there. Why did slow cookers seem to fall out of favor? Well, with the aggressive marketing of Instant Pots these last few years, the more low-key and decidedly inexpensive slow cookers have sadly been forgotten. Some people, myself included, even made the mistake of letting go of their slow cooker when they first got an Instant Pot, which I quickly found out to be a big mistake. From a business standpoint, slow cookers are just not great. The simpler they are, the better they perform, so you can't remarket them and sell more units simply by adding new, feature, new features every other year. No repeat customers, plus they don't even break easily. But don't be fooled. Slow cookers are great for plant-based cooking, and I recommend that you use yours at least once or twice per week. No more sitting on top of the fridge. In this post, I will review the main benefits of slow cookers for plant-based cooking. I will talk about the downsides and how to work around them and make some suggestions for recipes that work great in the crock. I would love to hear about your favorite slow cooker dishes. You can always email me at hello at veganfamilykitchen.com. So what are the benefits of using a slow cooker for plant-based cooking? Well, of course, there's the simplicity. Slow cookers basically apply the heat equivalent of a 100 watt light bulb all around a ceramic pot. So all you need to do is plug them in and switch them on. So it's easy. You just throw in a sensible bunch of ingredients and six to eight hours later, you have a delicious soup or stew. It's not fancy cuisine, really, but the vegetables will retain all their nutrients and the result is practically certain to be comforting. Anyone can do it. As for safety, as long as you put them far enough away from the edge of your counter and avoid touching the sides when they're really hot, well, nothing bad can happen when slow cooking. I love that they are set it and forget it. Put the food in there, add the lid, walk away. When you lift the lid again, six to eight hours later, your soup or your stew will be ready. Ease of cleaning is also a benefit. You only have one pot to clean. Assuming you didn't overfill it, the risk of spill is pretty low. Plant-based dishes rarely stick to the crock because they are really wet recipes with large volumes of water, broth, maybe tomatoes, and having the lid on prevents evaporation, thus avoiding the formation of a sticky rim around the crock. Finally, oil is optional. It's absolutely not necessary to add oil to cook plant-based ingredients in the slow cooker. If you want to learn more about my stance on oil, I have a whole uh, blog post and podcast episode about that. So what's not to love? Those benefits are the reasons why I include a slow cooked recipe in almost every single week of the vegan meal plans. What are the downsides of using a slow cooker for plant-based cooking then? And what can we do to avoid them? One downside is the possible blandness due to under seasoning. When we're cooking on the stovetop, we often simmer the soup or the stew for at least 20 minutes, often more. So during that time, some of the water content evaporates and that concentrates the flavors in a smaller content of water. In a slow cooker, the lid has to stay on for the whole cooking process because the heat applied is quite low. So I suggest using about 20% less liquid than you would use in a comparable stovetop recipe and also increasing the amount of seasoning for more flavorful results. You can also add uh, more spice. If using powdered vegetable broth, then you can use a little more power powder per volume of water. 
there's also less caramelization, and that contributes to the slightly less explosive flavor of dishes cooked in the slow cooker. When you're cooking on a stovetop, practically every soup or stew recipe starts with sautéing an onion, and often also carrots and celery, for at least five minutes. Upon contacting the heat, the vegetables release their sugars and they add great flavor. There's no direct way to replicate this in a slow cooker. There's a workaround for the issue. It's cooking extra onion when you prepare some other stovetop dish and refrigerate it for the next time that you need the extra sweetness in a slow cooker dish. Integrating the slow cooker to my weekend batch cooking session also helps streamline the process. If there's no cooked onion available, the boosting of the other flavorings like spices, herbs, maybe soy sauce, can make up for the reduced caramelization. And by the way, if all else fails, just stir in a teaspoon of maple syrup. It's tiny quantity in such a big pot. It will not negatively impact your health, but it will be enough to enhance the taste of your vegetable-based dish. Just don't tell anyone I said that, okay? Also in the slow cooker, well, there's no crunch. Simmering is by definition a wet cooking method. The flavors of each ingredient in your dish will meld together with those of other ingredients instead of remaining encapsulated. If you want to create a crunchy impression, well, you need dry heat. Still, you can make slow cooker dishes more complex and interesting by adding toppings before serving. Crumbled tortilla chips, vegan parm nuts, fresh or frozen corn kernels, sliced green onions. It's all good. What are my best recipes for the slow cooker? Slow cookers are the natural allies of all things simmered. So soups and stews are just perfect to cook in the crock. Here are some examples. In practically every case, you will want to start with an onion, add a bunch of vegetables, probably some beans or lentils, and suitable seasonings plus some liquids. First example, chilies and curries. Onion, garlic, carrots, bell peppers. I prefer red, but one green in the mix should probably be fine. Maybe also some diced squash or some other dense vegetables like cauliflower. Add cooked beans or chickpeas and also seasonings. For a chili, use cumin, oregano, chili powder, smoked paprika. For a curry, use instead, well, cumin again, but also coriander, turmeric, always with black pepper, and other Indian-inspired spices, plus ginger if you'd like. Add your preferred liquid combo, probably some combination of vegetable broth and or crushed tomatoes, maybe a can of coconut milk if you're making a creamy curry, so that the pot is half to three-quarter full, and cook the whole thing on low for seven to eight hours. What about lentil soups? We love lentil soups. Our favorite one is um, containing onion, garlic, ginger, carrots, orange sweet potato, maybe a bit of orange juice, or even just a peeled orange with the seeds removed, and about one and a half cups of red lentils. You have to rinse those before you put them in. And finally, five cups of vegetable broth. I add for spices cumin, turmeric, coriander, plus fresh ground pepper. Always add the fresh ground pepper, especially if you're using turmeric, and maybe a pinch of cinnamon. Why not? After six to eight hours, I blend it all smooth with an immersion blender. You can also make a more Euro-style veggie and lentil soup by using the ingredients from my rustic veggie soup recipe, and then you substitute the green lentils for the cannellini beans and you cook it all on low for seven to eight hours. You could keep the cannellini beans. I'm just saying that because I said you can make a lentil soup. What about spaghetti sauce? Keep it simple, guys. Onions, carrots, celery, lots of garlic, two big cans, you know, the 28-ounce ones of crushed tomatoes, plus oregano and basil. You can add maybe half a cup of green, brown, black, dry lentils, and perhaps one and a half cups of vegetable broth. Cook it all up for seven to eight hours on low. If you have time, instead of the lentils, you could crumble a package of extra firm tofu into chunks. Mix the tofu chunks with a little soy sauce, balsamic vinegar, and the liquid sweetener, just a little bit. I prefer blackstrap molasses here. And then roast the marinated crumbs in the oven for a little bit. Don't let them burn, but something like 375 degrees Fahrenheit for... 
I don't know, half an hour, depending on the size of your crumbs, is probably just fine. Just keep an eye on it. Blend the sauce smooth with an immersion blender if desired, and then add the roasted tofu crumbs if using. But even with just lentils inside, it's delicious. I love it when using the French de Puy lentils or the black beluga ones because they have a little bit more uh, firmness to them. Finally, it's a good idea to cook orange sweet potatoes and butternut squashes in the slow cooker. It can be a very convenient way to do it. I just plop uh, the veggies in the crock, as is, you know, brushed clean, and add one to two cups of water to cover the bottom of the crock. Make sure the lid is on so it doesn't run dry. Cook on low for at least six hours or until a knife pierces the vegetable's flesh easily. I suppose this would also work with beets, by the way. You'd have to brush them really clean before you start, but I have not yet tried. You would have to peel the beets once they're cool enough to handle, whereas the sweet potato skins are perfectly fine to eat and also very nutritious. So what slow cooker should you buy for plant-based cooking? Please buy the simplest slow cooker you can find with the smallest number of features. It should be manual, not electronic or programmable in any way whatsoever, with just a switch to choose between off, low, and high heat. Some slow cookers also feature a keep warm feature, and that's good uh, when you're serving, for example, bean chili to a crowd on game day, but really it's a frill that is not completely required. Why am I so allergic to features? My experience is that programmable and electronic slow cookers are prone to error and failure. We're not talking about pieces of equipment that cost $1,000 here, and I suspect that quality control is a little bit leaving to be desired. I have had one that would spontaneously switch from low to high at a random point during cooking, and that ruined my dinner. The electronic panel of another one just stopped working one day and could not be revived. Again, it ruined my dinner, it required replacement, and that's a lot of waste for no reason. The idea of programming the slow cooker to go from low to keep warm after a certain number of hours, yeah, it's appealing in theory, but really cooking on low for another hour will not ruin your soup. If no one will be back home to attend your food within 10 hours, yeah, that's probably a better idea to leave... Um, the soup for another day. It's not a great idea to have a small hot appliance running for that long anyway. What about the size? I find that the six quart size is perfect because it allows to cook approximately eight to ten individual portions with plenty of room to spare at the top so that the contents won't spill every time you stir. The extra food just goes for lunches or into the freezer for another week. Four quart slow cookers, I find they can be frustrating. They're a little too small for a doubled up recipe. The tiny two quart ones, well, they're really cute, but they're really only good to keep artichoke dip warm in a party spread. As for the really, really big eight quart slow cookers, they're too hard to store in my kitchen cabinets. I don't know about yours. And they're also slower to warm up, so it extends the cooking time. Where should I buy a slow cooker for plant-based cooking? Well, the simpler ones, those with only manual switch, as I just described, they're the perfect item to buy secondhand. Thrift stores and Facebook Marketplace are two common places to search. To be extra safe, you can test it with water and a thermometer before your first official use so that you don't ruin a pot of soup. The water should reach a temperature of at least 170 degrees Fahrenheit or 80 degrees Celsius on the low setting after, let's say, 3-4 to four hours. That should set you back about 10 bucks. You might score a free one from a friend or from your local Buy Nothing group project. If you insist on buying it from a store, the models I recommend cost less than $25. Whatever you do, please just don't get it from Amazon, okay? So why are slow cookers also great appliances for batch cooking? Weekend batch cooking sessions are the most efficient way to use our time in the kitchen, especially when we're following a carefully crafted plan. You can find a few of those on my website if you go to veganfamilykitchen.com and click on templates at the top. Adding a slow cooker to the mix can make those sessions go even further. Here is how. Number one, you have to plan at least one soup or stew on the stovetop and also one in the slow cooker. 
you double up number two the quantity of onions and if using also carrots and celery for the stovetop version of the recipe cook it all for 10 minutes stirring occasionally add garlic at the last minute then you transfer half the cooked onion mixture to the slow cooker dump in the rest of the slow cooker's recipe ingredients and cook on low for seven to eight hours the result will be a whole extra ready-made pot of soup or stew with hardly any additional dishes or time spent at the stove. I need to say something here about why I do not recommend cooking most dry beans from scratch in the slow cooker. Some beans, when raw, contain a naturally occurring lectin-type protein called phytohemagglutin, or PHA, forgive my pronunciation, and that uh, lectin, that specific lectin, can cause damage to red blood cells. Phyto means plant, hema means blood, and gluten refers to clumping together. Kidney beans have the most, but white beans like cannellini, fava beans, and black beans also have some. When PHA is detected in the gastrointestinal system, our bodies are very, very eager to get rid of it, and that leads to vomiting and diarrhea. Although it can be violent, the reaction is usually ridden out by healthy people in just a few hours. However, those with compromised health could end up in a hospital or worse. Thankfully, this can all be avoided by cooking the beans thoroughly. They need to be brought to at least 80 degrees Celsius or 176 degrees Fahrenheit for 30 minutes or more. It could be less if the beans have been previously soaked. Unfortunately, the slow cooker does not reliably reach those temperatures. Even if you're tested it, you never know exactly if somebody lifts the lid, it reduces the temperature, you can't be really safe, and really, who would want to feed possibly contaminated food to their friends? It's not worth it. That is why I don't recommend cooking dry beans from scratch in the slow cooker. My preferred method for cooking beans is the instant pot. Previously, I just used the stovetop method, but it does take longer, requires more attention, and it generates a lot of vapor. Chickpeas and lentils, however, are perfectly fine to cook in the slow cooker as they do not have a problem dose of PHA. I gotta say though, if you're worried about lectins in general, maybe after reading the book The Plant Paradox, please go to nutritionfacts.org uh, where Dr. Michael Greger debunks the myths in a series of three videos. One of them is called Are Lectins Good or Bad for You? Can't I use my Instant Pot instead of a slow cooker for plant-based cooking? Most or perhaps all electronic pressure cookers have a slow cook mode, but personally, I just don't trust them for that job. In single function slow cookers, the heat comes evenly distributed from all around the crock. Whereas in the Instant Pot, the element that heats up is on the bottom. It's more likely to lead to burnt food at the bottom of the pot and uncooked food at the top. This being said, if all you have is an Instant Pot right now, you can make it work almost like a slow cooker by using it on the low setting only. Check your manual, stirring the food every two to three hours or so, scraping the bottom to make sure there's no bits that end up burning there. And also you will need to increase possibly the total cooking time by perhaps an hour because every time you lift the lid, it decreases the temperature. Make sure to review your manual's instructions with regards to the proper lid placement during slow cooking or you can use a glass lid from a different pot. It may not be a perfect fit if you're going to walk away for the whole day, but if you're working from home like most of us right now, it's probably fine. If you have the extra space in your kitchen, perhaps above your fridge, consider spending $10 to get a separate slow cooker instead of relying on your Instant Pot. So, are you going to use your slow cooker to make soup or stew this week? Please email me and tell me about it. My address is hello at veganfamilykitchen.com and if you would like, you can also ask me at that time to send you a, a one-week or a two-week vegan, totally plant-based, healthy meal plan to cover your dinners so you do not have 
to decide what's for dinner every time. Again, my email is hello at veganfamilykitchen.com or you can just go to veganfamilykitchen.com and click on meal plans to learn more. It was lovely to be here with you today and I look forward to welcoming you again soon in my vegan family kitchen.